Okay. I think I'm starting now. Hi. I'm, going to, I'm Andres Freund. Uh, I work at Enterprise DB, and I'm going to talk about uh, the effort to get uh, just-in-time compilation to Postgres, what, have we, what we have integrated, what it currently can be used for, and what future improvements we need to make or should make or could make. Uh, to start off, and that wasn't clear to me when I was proposing this talk, in Postgres 11 we will have JIT compilation integrated, and I'm very, very happy about that. It took me like two plus three years of something of work to get here. Um, so, yeah, and you will have to enable it at compile time, but I'm not going to. Uh, hopefully your Postgres distribution will do that for you. I'm, at first I want to explain what we currently can do JIT compilation for, and there's ma basically two major things. One of them that we do JIT compilation for is expression evaluation. And expressions in Postgres are now used for everything from like where clauses, the invocation of aggregates, the grouping for group by, like comparing which group by clause, whether, whether those columns are equivalent, and other things like that. There's other parts that we can, could convert to using our expression evaluation engine, which would then also be jittable, but that's the current set. Yeah. And since Postgres QL 10, when we're not using JIT, uh, we use basically a bytecode code form of our expressions, and we have a bytecode interpreter that basically is just a huge switch around the opcodes, and that it switches, evaluates one opcode, goes to the next opcode, goes to the switch, goes to impl the implementation of the opcode, and so on. For example, the opcodes we generate for a very simple expression where we have just a dot column is smaller than 10, and a dot another column is equal to 3. Then we'll first generate an opcode that, fe uh, that fetches the that gets the columns out of the underlying t uh, table or row. Then we'll access the value of the column, a dot col, for this one. We evaluate the value of the constant, that's this one. And then we uh, uh, use a function uh, to determine what the value of a dot column uh, smaller than 10 is. In Postgres, all operations, all uh, operators, all functions are implemented using the same facility you can use to extend Postgres, which means they're just C functions that get called to implement something. You can also uh, use other languages to implement them, but all Postgres functions themselves are implemented using C functions. So that then in four less than will be called, will return something, and then we'll check whether we, the and, we don't have to process the other side of the and if this one is false, obviously, uh, then do the same thing for the other expression. And two things are worth noting here. Uh, if func x per strict here is, uh, if the, one of the arguments is null, we have to check whether any of the arguments is null because then it will also return null. That means we have conditional branches here. And similar for, we have a conditional branch in the and step where we will just short circuit the whole expression if it is false, because then we don't need to evaluate this part, or we could have something much longer here. For the people that know what that is, in Postgres, uh, the implementation, if your compiler provides support for it, it's direct threaded. Yeah. And there's a lot of jumps between them, because every time we evaluate one, that, one of those expressions, we have to evaluate the next one, and that means we have to jump from one part of the implementation to the next one, and the Postgres source code doesn't know which parts of expression follow which o each other, so that has to be generic, so it's an indirect jump, basically. An expensive one at that. This one can fairly obviously be JIT compiled by just omitting this main, the main part, the sequence of these opcodes as uh, just-in-time co compiled code. So we basically emit code that, with some infrastructure behind it that uh, just uh, invokes the code for that implements this, then invokes the code that implements this, then invokes the code that implements that, and that gets rid of all the constant, uh, the indirect jumps from these different type of jumps, because, uh, sequences, because, because we compile it, we know what uh, instructions follow, what other instructions. And then for a lot of these, we also have faster implementations that are just in time compiled where we know we can do something specific if the if the parameter is a constant, then we can just, instead of invoking an implementation that 
implement the return to, to constant, we can just set the value to a constant value. If we in, instead, for example, instead of do for function expressions, we don't have to do an indirect function call to in four equals, we can just directly call in four equals. And that reduces a lot of, uh, removes, reduces the number of indirect jumps quite a bit. And doing this gets us quite a bit of a performance win. For example, I measured most of it using TPHCH, not because it's a great benchmark, but because it's like so standard and it's just relatively simple to set up, and I just was familiar with it. Um, if we enable jitting just for the um, expression evaluation, the time for query execution on a scale 100 database goes from 28 seconds to 22 seconds. We reduce the uh, number of branch misses by quite a bit, but the really, really big difference is that the number of ITL load misses, and that's basically fetching the code to execute the next part of the expression, goes from 58 million to 48,000. So we have like, what, three orders of magnitude or something, less indirect uh, like code loads, and that makes obviously the execution a lot faster. I had to measure this like five times because I didn't believe that the reduction was actually that large. The other thing that we do uh, now perform jitting on is tuple deforming. Tuple deforming is basically uh, converting the tuple as it is stored on disk, where, we, where density is quite an important thing. I mean, we could improve on the density, but that's another topic. <laughs> but it is still a lot more dense than our in-memory representation, where we want to access very individual columns very often, repeatedly. Uh, where we want to potentially convert the on-disk format into something a bit more efficient, like the individual columns into something more efficient. Uh, that process is called deforming in Postgres. And we do it mostly lazily, which means that we'll deform only the columns on a, on a tuple that we need actually for the current expression, and then we have some caching that uh, avoids doing this repeatedly. And that process of deforming is a major bottleneck in query execution because there's, again, a lot of indirect jumps because our code that does this deforming can't know is the column a fixed width one or is it a, a variable length one where we have to look inside the datum or all of that. Do we have to copy the data out of place or can we leave it there? All that, the code has to be very generic, which means we have like 30 branches for each different uh, field inside a table, even though there might not be any uh, branches necessary. For example, if we have... Uh, a table that only consists of out of integers, and all of those integers are not null. Then we don't. Then the tuple deforming is basically just moving a bunch of integers from the tuple data into where we cache them, and it's just there's no conditional branches there at all. So we can go from like 30 branches roughly to zero branches for the simplest case of fixed with uh, columns that are not null. And if we do measure that again with TPCHQ1. We see that the time goes from 22 milliseconds to 19.5 seconds, and we can see that even though we process more data per second, the number of branches we execute per second goes down. Because, like, even, so even though we do more work per second, we do less branches per second, which is precisely what we expect because we now don't do any of the branches that we needed to do for each column. But there's lots of other branches in Postgres when executing a query, so that's why the number is still pretty significant. I mean, it's still amazing that we can do uh, one billion branches, basically, a second on a system. <laughs> it's still, I think, still find that very baffling. <laughs> so in which cases do we expect JIT compilation to be good? It's in the current form and in the foreseeable future, it's not going to be good if you do all TP queries. If all your queries take one millisecond or less, or are one row inserts, then the overhead, like then doing the work that we do JIT compilation on, namely expression evaluation or something or a tuple deforming, is not going to take any meaningful amount of time. And the additional work of doing JIT compilation will just make it slower. So all TP workloads for the foreseeable future, there's some. I'll talk later about when. We, what we might change about that will not be beneficial. If you have analytics, various forms of analytics workloads, be they pure, uh, pure data warehouse type queries, some hybrid transactional workload, uh, analytical workload queries, uh, 
there you might, it's more likely that you will see benefits. But it's also important to know that if your query is currently, for example, completely I.O. bound because you have a very, like, have a rotating disk and all your query is doing is index lookups, millions of them, then the bottleneck is going to be I.O. Because, like, each access takes, I don't know, 10 milliseconds, the CPU is not going to be the bottleneck. But in a lot of queries, you have a buffer cache that reduces most of those uh, accesses away, like makes them cheap enough, or you have fast storage because you have a bunch of SSDs which make the random access a lot faster. So it's not that rare, actually, to have CPU-bound queries. Even on a rotating disk, if you have something like a TPCHQ, uh, TPCH, a lot of them are actually not I.O. bound for reasonable size databases. They are CPU bound. With, and the parallelism in Postgres makes that better, but you still can be mostly CPU bound for uh, a lot of queries. And even, but even for CPU bound queries, the cases where uh, jitting will help, a JIT compilation will help a lot. Namely, when if, if you have a lot of expressions that are super complicated, if for example, if you do a query that aggregates, like does 10 aggregates over a table, then you're very, very likely going to see significant uh, performance improvements. But if you have like a query that just does, do, does a lot of index nested loop joins, like 100 tables joined together with index nested loop joins, each returning exactly one row, then it's very unlikely that you're going to see a lot of benefits because the overhead there go, is going to be in the indexing code, and the indexing code is not jitted. So it really depends on what kind of workload you have. Um, this is the GPAQ1 query, by the way, but I mostly want to mention that because of one thing. This is a perf profile of that query. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention, uh, show here, is that even though if we spend a lot of time in those functions that implement uh, these operators, for example, in TPCHQ1, we have, mo like, in the way I set it up, we have a lot of floating point things. That's why we have, like, spent a good chunk of uh, time either executing the, float, the, the functions that implement the floating point operations or the uh, aggregate for floating points. So one further optimization that we have done is that we can inline the implementation of these functions because normally adding two floating point uh, numbers is actually something that our CPUs can do really, really fast, but it's not really the mathematical operation that is the overhead. It's the calling the mathematical over, uh, function then doing a bunch of overflow checks, whether the two floating point operations uh, overflow the range and return infinity, because in our implementation of SQL, that raises an error, even though the standard really is very unclear whether, what the right behavior there is. So we allow to inline those in the, the, into the running into the later, greater expression, and that allows the compiler or the, the just-in-time compilation phase to optimize that a lot. I don't want to go into the implementation detail of that because that's too complicated for this. So just to want to, to quickly show what roughly the benefits can be, this is JIT compilation on TPCHQ1 again, scale 100, fully cached. Um, and you can see that this axis here is the amount of parallelism. It helps both on no parallelism and greater uh, amounts of parallelism, but you can see that the amount, the percentage of uh, the improvement goes down a little bit, and that's because there's a bunch of the work that is essentially independent of expression evaluation and independent of the parallelism. So it's like that part of the work just doesn't get any faster due to JIT compilation, and the parallelism has paralyzed a lot of the other work, so we don't see as much of a benefit anymore. And currently, if you can't want to configure it, at the moment, in the beta 1, it's enabled by default. If you compile support for it, there's a configuration variable that allows you to turn it off. And we might change that setting shortly before the Postgres 11 release. It's an open items note. And we haven't yet quite decided what, whether we want to do that or not. But at the moment, it's enabled by default. I unfortunately didn't list that config setting here. It's just JIT equals on or JIT equals off. And with that, you can enable it on a global level whether you want it, and that's the only thing we are going to flip back and forth if we do that, so before the release. There's three settings at the moment that determine whether we do JIT compilation or not. Uh, they, we always do the decision whether we want, we want to do JIT compilation on a whole query basis. That is, the normal planning phase runs, the, the, we 
the planner figures out how costly it th thinks the plan is, and then we just check whether the total cost of the query is bigger than some GUC. And if that configuration variable, for example, JIT above cost, then we do JIT compilation for that query. And if it's, that's, I think, 100,000 or something by default, I forgot what it is. Um, and that, in that, if, we, if it's just higher than that, then we don't perform any optimization on the generated code, because even the unoptimized uh, generated code is faster than not doing JIT compilation, or can be. Um, but if it's even more expensive query, then do we do optimization? And LVM has a fairly, uh, in which we use to back JIT compilation, has a fairly involved set of optimizations, but they can take a lot of time, so we don't want to always do them, because that can take substantial time on its own. And if another setting is, uh, determines whether you want to do inline these operators that we have seen. And all of them, if you can set them to minus one, then that kind of uh, operation will never be JIT compiled. For example, you could say, JIT, I, I don't want to do JIT inlining for some reason because it uses a bit more memory or something, or it causes a bit more I.O. So I'm going to disable just this one, JIT inline up above cost to minus one, and then in JIT inlining will never be performed. It's worth, really worth to stress that at the moment, this is a, a whole query decision, and it's not a tracing JIT. What we, we don't see, hey, this function has been executed a thousand times, now we do JIT compilation. Because we have a query planner that does costing for us, we can say, the whole query, all the expressions therein will be JIT compiled if the total cost of the query is higher. So I just want to show quickly how that looks. This is, as the, is this readable from behind or should I make the font bigger? Um, this is just on my laptop and it's a 10 gigabyte, uh, the TPCH database with scale 10. And in some seconds we'll hopefully see the result. Uh, of the query, and I mostly want to show that so we can see how explain will display whether JIT compilation is done or not. And I'm surprised, oh, there we go. We can see that there's a new section about, uh, in the explain output that shows what JIT compilation do is done, and if JIT compilation is disabled or if it decides not to do JIT compilation, then that whole section will just not be there, so that allows you to see whether JIT compilation has been done. You can see that in this query, nine, function has been, nine functions have been JIT compiled. We know, we see that uh, inlining has been performed because inlining is true, and that the inlining took 46 milliseconds. I'll get back to that time in a second. We have see that optimization has been performed, and that that 100 milliseconds, and that the code had to be written out to the, to, had to be generated, and that is the emission time. It's worth to note that that is, uh, uh, a sub part of the execution time, it's not an additional time. But as you can see here, we, the t in total, the JIT, JITing took quite a while. We spent uh, 1.5 milliseconds, that, so that's not long, to generate the program. Then we took 40, 150, 240 or something milliseconds to optimize and execute, uh, build the code, the actual code. That's not nothing. If your query, if the same query had a lot less data and we, it would only take 250 milliseconds, we would have doubled the query, or not quite doubled, but like we, one, we would, the query would took, take one and a half times long because the, the overhead of doing the JIT compilation would be exactly the same it would, and then afterwards execute faster, but it would not uh, be worth it because we spent more time doing the JIT compilation than we saved. And It, there's a bit, it's roughly that, yes. I mean, it will be where clauses, it will be inside expressions when they access columns, then that normally in the unjitted world does tuple deforming, and if we know enough, then we will also uh, do tuple, like do generate a JIT program for tuple deforming, and that will also be a function. It's just a rough measure of how much a total was, uh, how much code was generated. I could possibly, we could say nine functions and then on average those were this size, I guess. This is just, I, I, would, I would expect that this output will change over the next releases because this is just the basics. 
Um, at the moment, every time you execute this, it will do all the JIT work from scratch. So um, that is obviously uh, means that it will never be useful for very short queries. And if you have a query that is massively complex, those times can be significantly higher. Uh, if you do something really crazy, you can spend a couple of seconds doing the JIT compilation. Um, this, if you want to just, for example, see what JIT code uh, is being generated, you can enable that. I mean, you can, as you can see here, the, we had, had a different setting for the optimization and for the inlining. If you remove those, the emission time will also be smaller because like a lot less code will be generated and the code will be simpler. So if in, even in Java, like the comp or depending on which Java implementation, it will use different, depending on how often something was executed, it will use different optimization levels. And you can easily spend a lot more time but you can also, it's also a question what you optimize for. Do you optimize for super quick code execution, uh, emission? And that is a choice for a lot of uh, browsers, for example, have made. They have a super, super, super fast JIT implementation that basically has, does no optimization at all. It just emits the code and does it after like 15, 20 execution of the same basic block. And then they have, after you've executed a couple hundred times or sometimes in the background, they run something that optimizes the code further and then replace it. So this is reasonable times. Uh, we could optimize this further, but I think that's roughly what you would expect. I'll go a bit in what we can do to improve that in a couple of slides. What about prepared? Is that, is that in the JIT? No, at the moment, there's no caching at whatsoever. Yeah. We want, definitely want to change that, but at the moment, there's none. I'll, if you give me a second, I'll show you one reason why. So this is the code that is generated. Um, it's not exactly trivial to read. <laughs> um, but like this is the, uh, where is it here? You can see that it, this is. I don't see a comment on this code. <laughs> <laughs> this is read only code, like quite literally. <laughs> Write only code, quite literally. Um, there's comments in the code that generates this. Um, evil express, for example, one of the functions that is generated to ex evaluate ex the expression. And one of the reasons that A, we still spend a lot of time in this, and B, why it is not cacheable, is currently that if you, let me just grab for it. If you have a function call, like for example here, we execute the date less or equal function. Then we, you can see that we ha pass it uh, a constant point, a pointer as a constant. And unfortunately that we have to pass around these pointers severely limits what LVM can op do to optimize. This is the un unoptimized code, by the way. If you optimize it, it looks a lot even less readable. Um, the, because then LVM can't see through which, whether we write the same data to the same block and then optimize the whole right away and so on. And interestingly, if you have functions that are not strict, that is, if you call them with null input, they are still executed, then the optimizer is good enough to see through that. But if you have to check whether the arguments are null, then the optimizer can't see, see through that. So that's because most functions are strict. That's not actually that good news. So we have to do something in the next version to get rid of all these pointer constants. Because the other reason why they're, they're really bad leaving the efficient code aside, is that uh, if they're pointer constant that point to currently allocated memory, we can fundamentally can cache them. Because we could cache this, and then, then it would never be reused because the pointer constants would be different. So this is definitely something that we have to address and make better. 
function which uh, not only uh, return now on any now input but also never return now on <laughs> no, no, what could, could help because you can once check that input values. I don't think no. I, I was thinking about that. I think we don't really need it because if we move this uh, I mean, the Postgres function call interface is relatively a high overhead, but if we move this allocation of this function call info data where we store the arguments and so on, and if we move that into like a LVM stack allocation, LVM completely optimizes it away. Okay. Then afterwards, you don't need, it doesn't, it works perfectly. Okay. It's just that the over, like, the, we need, need to rewrite how the expression evaluation stuff works, so it is ready to do everything with relative pointers and so on, and that's not super hard, it's just a lot of work. I, worked on it on the slide here. The current diff is more than 30,000 lines. But it's all the same changes. It's like super manual kind of changes. I just need to make it more readable. And after that, the code is a good chunk faster. And one other thing that I wanted to uh, show is um, that uh, if you have a very recent version of LVM, it has support for doing perf profiling uh, of the digital programs, for some reason this ha doesn't did, only had O profile support, and I didn't even get O profile to compile on a current machine. <laughs> and I think the curl support is also going to be removed. So yeah, I don't quite understand how they live with that. But So what I'm doing is basically I run perf, give it a bunch of parameters for the PID and write it to a file. I'm going to remove the analyze so we don't have timing overhead. And if I have, you, to do that you have to set a setting that is JIT uh, profiling support and in that case it writes a bunch of uh, profiling data uh, like writes out which the programs that we've generated to some spe specific file that, L, uh, that perf knows about because it did some magic mmap that the kernel then registers and knows about where that file is. And then that allows us to inject that code. And we can see these evil expr functions here, which are the functions we just generated. Uh, it shows up in the profile. We can look at the, the assembly code. And you can even do a look at how this go, looks in the total car graph. So we can see that in this query, all the time is spent in exec egg. If we fold that out, we can see that the scan is about 30%. Manipulation of the hash tables about 30%, and expect, uh, this one is the, co the invocation of the transition functions. So even if after we've done jitting, we spend 30% in doing the aggregation invocation, the scan also actually uh, spends about 70% doing the workloads evaluation, and the hash table is actually turns out to be mostly comparing whether two tuples are the same or in doing the hash. Function, hashing of the input columns. And that one is currently not jitted. But you can see, even after the jitting work, we still spend most of the time doing expression evaluation overhead. And it's worthwhile to note that expression evaluation will have inlined the tuple deforming curve. But that's, so that's partially because the query is just insanely doing a lot of aggregates at the same time, so that's always going to be some, uh, like a lot of overhead, but also because our code that we, as I explained before with the pointers and so on, is just not very good yet at this point. You can do a lot more there. When the, uh, when the compilation happens on every expression, every, every execution, is there a garbage that's ever left behind, or are those uh, dynamically generated? Oh, the, 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 those that SOs are just for perf. So perf, like the perf inject generator writes them out, and then the, that's just a dirty hack inside perf. It has nothing, we don't write out an injured SOs or anything like that. So no. Um, if you enable the jit dump bit code thing that I used earlier to generate the code, then it will leave the files behind. But that's not a production operation, it's just for like debugging and this investigations. But like normally, no. And yeah, perf just generates them because they don't know how to access that, those additional information, that uh, information at perf report time. 
jitted expression evaluation, uh, will I manage later <laughs> to understand something in the core dump produced? The core dump is hard, but what you can, if you attach a debugger and you use a recent version of LVM, mm -hmm. I added support so we can get read, like, so the C interface exposes that you can register it with GDB. So if you use GDB, it will show up as normal symbol. You can set up a breakpoint on it. You can get backtraces through it and everything, but you need a recent version of LVM because I only committed that code like two weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, but like in core file it's hard because at core file time all that knowledge is not easily available anymore. Core files, so what is not usable? The, the, the debugging information, oh. that, because that just gets re registered in some memory and it has overhead. So you also, so if you want to do that, you should put this debugging information inside core, core file. I didn't think there's an easy way to do that because the kernel doesn't give you control back in a core dump. Yes, but in principle, it dumps the process memory which could contain debugging. The problem is that uh, the way the GDB, uh, deb like JIT interface, only works by putting, making a symbol visible once you attach, and then after that, GDB, like the, the debugging support in, in LVM, registers something inside a variable that GDB knows about. But if, I think it doesn't work if you attach, to have GDB attached beforehand, because then it doesn't know to record all that information. I, I don't quite, like it might be possible to always do that, but at the moment I think the code only works if you have GDB attached. But it's, and that is also hidden by, behind an option. Like you have to enable JIT debugging support to make it record that information because it's actually not particularly cheap. Because like you have to generate the dwarf information and everything that okay. implies some overhead. So uh, just to, this is the, what I used for profiling, just for posterity's sake. So this is basically what I just said. For, uh, we need to improve the code so we don't uh, do, so we allow more information, uh, more optimizations done by LVM, and also so we can reuse it. And that, I don't quite know which of those is more important. And there's, to, for both, there's a number of things we can do, but uh, that's, some, I think, the biggest project that we need to do, and I do hope to plan, to, uh, or I do hope to work on that in the next cycle, because it's probably hard to do that if you haven't written the expression information stuff. So for caching, and I think that's really important, uh, that's actually, if once the earlier project is done, that makes them, the code actually be, like not contain pointers, it's actually not that hard because LVM, we can just, it provides all the information to just change the lifetime. You just need a ref counter at each uh, digit expression to say, hey, do we still want to maintain it? And then we need to have some cache and validation policy to evict old things, and then that's, fairly straightforward. I think one of the actually harder questions there is what do we use as the key to that caching? We could, the easiest thing to do is to just always generate the code and then do like a hash function over the generated code and then use that, but that requires, while well, that saves us to redundantly do the optimization, emitting the code, it still requires us to generate the LVM IR, and that's not exactly cheap. Another thing what we could do is we could, could uh, do a fingerprint based on the, like the plant tree which could convert it to the text representation and do that, but that's also fairly expensive. The, I suspect we are going to go to fingerprinting the LVM IR because that only takes like usually milliseconds or something or less to generate and then additionally hook that information into pre prepared statements. So we can know, hey, this prepared statement, we have done that once, here's the key, go ahead with that. And then we'll have the best of both worlds, kind of somewhat. I don't quite have a better idea how we can do that unless we have a more global plan cache, which seems like some large separate project. Um, it's also a question whether we want to do that JIT cache, make that persistent, whether we want to make it shared between backends, make it non-shared. I suspect I would start with just doing a very simple local hash table then uh, later move to a shared hash, and if somebody else wants to make this persistent, because I suspect that's going to be worthwhile, then they, we can do that later, words, but I, uh, later, but I think 
I would probably start with a local one, although I'm not quite sure how much more work it is to make it shared. We can just use the DS hash stuff that we now have to make it uh, shared. It's probably not that hard. I don't think the locking would be that complicated, but I haven't thought that much about it. But I mean, like, what I'm thinking is to make the cache the same based on the IR fingerprint. Just based on the IR. And then if you, once you looked it up, then you can put it into the prepared statement. Okay. And then that removes for the further executions the overhead of looking up that. That would be my yeah. guess. And I think even then for the prepared statement, we would have, need to have some logic to deal that we only do that once we have the custom, we don't do custom plans anymore. Because yeah. so as long as we do custom plans, it's probably not worth it. So there's some uh, follow-up complexity, but it's, I think that's why I'm planning for, to go for the, what I, what I would suggest for somebody else, because I don't want to do this, uh, to do the fingerprint-based uh, method first. Another thing is that right now, we, if we do jitting, we first do the jitting, and then we execute the jitter code. But uh, that's fine if the total time is less than the uh, query like the unjitted query execution, but it can easily look like this. We, the actual executed code is good and faster, but because of the jitting overhead, we spend more time uh, doing in total. And be that's made worse because we don't currently do caching. But even if you had caching, uh, if there's a lot of queries where each query execution will look different. And you can do things like uh, force prepared statements to be used when they are not by replacing constants in query, like that's force parameterization, but like all of that still won't work for everything if you just write ad hoc queries that change from execution to execution. So we want to make the case where we unnecessarily, where we do JIT, but it doesn't help less painful. And we want to take advantage of JITing in cases where uh, it makes the query faster, but it's prohibitively expensive. So the thing what you could do is to only at the query execution, we only generate the JIT program. We don't do anything further. Then we start the unjitted program and execute normally. And in the background, either in a separate process or in a thread, we do, uh, I mean, there's no shared data, so it's not actually that bad. Um, do uh, the JIT compilation in the background. Potentially, we can do it the first time around without any optimization. So that's relatively click quickly. Then we go and uh, there's appropriate point, we replace the execution that we currently do uh, with the jitted one, like the interpreted one. Execute, once it's finished executing, we check, hey, is the jitted program now ready? And then replace it, and then the next execution will use the jitter program. There's some complexity there because we have to share enough state and so on, but it's actually not that problematic. And then we can later on use the jitter query execution. So, and that gives us a bit of the best of the both worlds. We waste a bit of resources if the query finishes faster than the JIT query, uh, JITing. But if that's not the case, then we reduce the startup overhead, but did not get, it get the benefit as soon as it was ready. Um, what I would really, if we went there, the, uh, the way I would do it is really that we emit the unoptimized JIT once, because that's fairly quick, then go and do uh, the expensive optimizations with uh, inlining later. And the really crazy version of that is that you, when you do it at the beginning, you do enable profile guided optimization. So it do, that does emit the profile uh, information. You execute it for a while, then you use the profile guided, uh, recompile it again with the profile information and get even faster execution. That's obviously the... That's JDM. <laughs> no, they don't really do... No, no, they don't do... No, they don't do PGO. Oh, they do. Not really. A very, very simple version of it. Well, simpler one, well, anyway. But yes, that is what a bunch of other, other uh, pieces of software do. Let's not na name names. But yes, I think that's really where we would like, where we like to go. Uh, I think also we need, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, there is a significant drawback or the less approach you described that uh, by doing things in parallel, you affect other sessions. It's important to not forget about sessions. Hmm. Sure. 
solve an original code, so sometimes it's a good idea to uh, pro profile it, and if it's worse, uh, that's, go back. It's, I haven't managed to figure a single case where that is the case. Well, Fine. I, I know it, sometimes it's a case in Java, and uh, they implement it, like uh, go, uh, going back like, to, to the bytecode. I don't see that happening. Because, like, I mean, if you look at the code that is generated for expression evaluation and the interpreted version, it's just, it's very hard to be less, like, less efficient there. Mm -hmm. So I don't, like, it's, the overhead is really just the doing the JIT compilation. That can still hurt you. But, like, I, other than that, I don't foresee that. Um, we also need to make some improvements on the planning. Because at the moment, we do a decision based on the whole query. If the whole query is more expensive, then we JIT expre uh, compile every single expression in the whole plan tree. But there can very well be expressions that are only evaluated once. You could have it at the top level like a one-time filter. And a one-time filter is absolutely guaranteed to only be executed once. There's never a point to JIT compile that. But you currently don't have uh, the awareness baked in. Similarly, we, uh, at the moment, oh, that is actually fixed. But like for values, uh, values we drop, we rebuild the expression tree every time because we want to save memory, because there could be a lot of values expressions. So there's never any benefit in JIT compiling those, even if you exe execute a million, insert a million rows, because it just torn down every time. You could also improve that, but yeah. But similarly, you might have a hash table over like a table with like four rows. JIT compiling the, the call inside that might also not be beneficial. So we want to be able to improve things so we do the decision whether each individual expression is JIT compiled at a smaller granularity, but we will still want to do all the JIT compilation of the whole thing at once, because that allows us to gain more efficiency during the JIT compilation phase. We could also have a bunch of logic that says, if prepared statements is in use and we have caching and so on, then we can use JIT compilation more aggressively, because we, it's more likely that the same statement is going to be executed quite often, or we could have logic inside that counts how often the same prepared statement has been executed. And if the same uh, queries has been executed a thousand times, then we just reduce the cost to zero and we just always do JIT compilation or something like that. So for prepared statements, uh, JIT code once and uh, reuse the each executed. Not yet, but, but I want to get, get there. Good. But yes, it still requires the, the, the code generation not to refer, refer to pointers because they will be different for each execution. So that is prohibitively expensive. Yeah, uh, I think there is a bunch of things that we want to JIT that we haven't done JITting on. What, the biggest thing is that we want to do JITting on the main executor code flow, which node calls which node calls which node, because those are the main source of uh, cache miss, like uh, uh, one uh, instruction cache misses, and we spend a lot of time doing those. Uh, and uh, it's all indirect function, uh, function, uh, function, uh, function pointers, and that's pretty expensive. Um, has a lot of complexity in doing it. The other things are a lot easier. We can, like, for example, copy spends a lot of time doing parsing, and if you have knowledge about how many columns to expect, it actually gets cheaper. It calls input functions or output functions, depending on which order you go, and that actually can be a lot cheaper if you know which functions you're calling. It's also not that hard. Doing the, for aggreg hash aggregate and hash joins, the computation of the hash values at the moment is quite noticeable in profiles, depending on a how many rows you process. That is, I have set a prototype a while back. That would be not that hard to do. Sorting of tuples would also be another good case. And those are the things that I can think of. Any questions? You have. At the moment, no, but you could relatively easily add that to pgstat statements, for example, because all the information is available at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no infrastructure for that at the moment. You could do it from an extension. You wouldn't have to modify core code because the information is there. But I haven't done anything of that, given that I merged this relatively briefly <laughs> before the merge window. The 
core essentials were my focus. seems unlikely that that is beneficial to me because like the overhead is so much elsewhere. Like if you do like a write ahead lock that's going to drown out the checking of check constraints like any day. Like yeah, I I suspect it wouldn't be very like the high, I, I haven't seen it in profiles to be meaningful. And like if you have like uh, triggers they're usually going to be PLPG SQL which is not just compiled and stuff. Yeah. So I wouldn't suspect it's a huge thing, but I, I mean, if you profile it and see whether you can see a case where it ta takes time and then. The whole thing, I mean, sub expression and PLGSQL can be just compiled this way. The whole thing I think is like a two thirds rewrite of PLPGSQL because it just doesn't, like the representation just doesn't lend itself very much to doing this. Um, it's not impossible, but would be a fair amount of work. I suspect that actually what I would do if I were to tackle this pro project, which I'm not going to, uh, is to turn that into ex the expression evaluation stuff into tight, integrate more tightly with that, and then just rely on the expression evaluation to just compile all of that. But this, I, haven't, I don't even know the code that, of PLPJ skill that well to make super informed decision, but I, I'm not seeing it soon. Sorry. Is there any heuristic to estimate the memory consumption of the grid? No. Okay. I, <laughs> this is version one. <laughs> uh, I also think it's not super easy to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, LVM, doesn't, LV, LVM doesn't have any infrastructure to do that internally. No, and it's I, not I, obvious. I, I mean, maybe like, okay, it's approximately oh. 10 megabytes. Oh, like for uh, Q1, it, like the generation is like less than a megabyte, and the optimization with optimization inlining is like a 22 or something. Is, is it per session or like globally? Per query. Mm -hmm. Like it per JIT effort. Like, and the generated code is super small. I mean, the generated code is afterwards, I don't know, I think 570 bytes for one of the functions or something. Like, it's really small. Like, it's smaller than our expression tree. But, yeah. Okay, cool, I think we're done. I'm also out of time.